Thank you very much. We like that uh, anticipatory buzz that we all heard there. People talking in excited voices for our second half. Uh, our first point in the second half is Danny Absey. And uh, it was the late Gavin Hewitt, the poet, who said that there's no gap sometimes between being a bright young thing and a grand old man. There's nothing in between. And it seems to me with Danny Absey, we need to invent a new term. I don't want to call him old. I want to call him senior. And I think he's a bright senior thing. That's what he is. And it seems that he's created and defined this brand new category. And he is advanced in years. There's no denying that. But his work has got the vigour and the excitement of the younger poet. But what is there in this book and in all his work is the result of a long, long apprenticeship. When my mother-in-law bakes her wonderful apple pies, she doesn't use a recipe. She uses accumulated knowledge. She uses craft and the things she heard her mother say and a weighing of ingredients that's become totally instinctive. And that's what Danny Absey does. It doesn't mean it gets any easier, but I think the road for somebody who's had a long apprenticeship gets a bit clearer. And at the start of the book, the first poem begins, in the mildew of age, all pavements slope uphill towards an exit. But I think they don't. I think for Danny Absey, it's towards another, another entrance. And this book also, I've got to tell you, contains the sexiest poem about a cricket bat that you'll ever read. <laughs> Danny Absey. You know, the evening started with um, a poem um, of T.S. Eliot's, and I couldn't help thinking when Ian read it um, how it, was, it begins, the cold coming we had of it, and it was translated into German, we had a cold coming just at the wrong time of the year. The first poem in this book is called Talking to Myself. In the mildew of age, all pavements slope uphill. I read it better than Ian. <laughs> in the mildew of age, all pavements slope uphill, slow, slow, towards an exit. It's late, and light allows the darker shadow to be born of it. Courage, the ventriloquist bird cries. A little god he is, censor of language. Remember plain Hardy and Dandy Yates in their inspired, wise pre-dotage. I, old man, in my new timidity, think how profligate I wasted time. Those yawning postponements on rainy days. Those paper hat hours of benign frivolity. Now time wastes me. And there's hardly time to fuss for more vascular speech. The aspen tree trembles as I do. And there are feathers in the wind. Quick, quick, speak, old parrot. Do I not feed you with my life? <clears throat> Some years ago, um, my late wife um, published a, a shrub, shrub, published, planted a shrub <laughs> in the front garden. I think I'll put my glasses on, I'll think better. And it, um, it didn't flower till a couple of years ago. And I wrote this poem called Scent. Lately, going in and out of the house we once shared, I sometimes think that the dead have many disguises. So I hesitate at the blue painted gatepost, there where the evening midges dance 
because of the propinquity of a twining shrub you long ago planted. Now, in jubilating flower, and surrendering faintly its button-holding scent, one so alluring, so delinquent, it could have made Adam fall on Eve with delight in Eden. In this world, the scent could have haunted the sacred gardens of Athens to distract a philosopher from his thoughts, or wafted through an open window of the great library in Alexandria unbidden, prompting a scholar to uplift his eyes from his scroll. But what do I care about that? For me now, you are its sole tenant. Compelled, I linger, allowing myself the charm and freedom of inebriating fancy, till the scent becomes only the scent itself returning. And I, at the gate, like Orpheus, sober, alone, and a little wretched, a poem called Cats. One Saturday afternoon in Istanbul on waste ground fit for a parking lot, not far from the Galata Bridge, the hullabaloo of two cats copulating. We observed a man built like a poster hero, like a poster hero, one savage arm raised, a stone in his fist. Cats in England are private creatures. They fuck in private as Englishmen do. <laughs> different country, different cats. <laughs> Yet they make an inhuman noise just as the English do. I uttered an unarmored, leave him alone. The poster hero ignored me as much as the busy cats ignored him. He stooped to weigh another stone. On behalf of the British Council, who had hired me, and all animal lovers, these two cats were animal lovers. <laughs> Not to mention D.H. Lawrence and the sanctity of lovemaking, it's the subject of my future lecture. I asked my translator to translate. After a, a protein-rich Turkish dialogue, the muscular no of a man continued to shower stones on the cats, and the cats continued their joyous coupling. He's stoning them, explained my translator, because he says they're both male cats. <laughs> Grimly, I stared at the grim poster hero, and the more I stared, the more he grew more muscular. I turned away without valor, and soon, as if by appointment, we encountered an unjudging beggar. Gratefully, I dropped a few coins in his cap. Thank you, but I've only got eight minutes. <laughs> Some bright, a love poem. Some bright, Some bright, you said, the first time we met in Venice, you so alive with human light. I was dazzled black, like heavy morning curtains in a sleeping bedroom suddenly pulled back. And the first time you undressed, once more I, frail-eyed, Undeservedly blessed, as if it were a holy day, as if it were Yuletide, and feeling a little drunk, simply had to look away. Well, circumspect Henry James couldn't write the turn of the skew till he turned his back on Sunbright, chair around just so to what was alive, beguiling in the canaletta scene below. Sweet. All this is true, or virtually true. It's only a poetry licensed lie. When I rhyme and cheat and wink and swear, I almost need to wear muses help me cross my heart, sunglasses each time I think of you. And finally, <coughs> some years ago I read a few lines um, well, a poem of, of Rilke's in translation, actually, 
And um, I, I haven't been able to trace it, but I remember the, the movement of the poem, and uh, I've tried to recapture it in this poem, which I've called Rilke's Confession. Whoever weeps somewhere in the night without comfort mimics me. Whoever laughs somewhere in the night without cause frightens me. Whoever wanders somewhere in the night without purpose counsels me. Whoever screams somewhere in the night without mercy bruises me. Whoever makes love somewhere in the night without love rebukes me. Whoever dies somewhere in the night with no one by precedes me. Thank you. Thank you very much to Danny Absey, and it's true that poets are here to renew and refresh the language, so in future we'll all think about publishing a shrub rather than planting a shrub. What a great way to put that, let's keep that.